Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first First Bell Lecture of calendar year 2023. Uh, today, Dr. Roger Bailey is going to join us to talk about leadership and ethics in the early American Naval Officer Corps, and in particular, how the officers of the antebellum era engaged with American debates over slavery. Later this semester, we're going to be hosting Dr. Heather Haley from the Naval History and Heritage Command. And we've got two more events that we're working on scheduling for later in the semester, so stay tuned to your emails. I'm Commander B.J. Armstrong, the Principal Associate of the Forum on Integrated Naval History and Sea Power Studies. Our first Bell Lectures are a joint effort by FINS with the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. And both organizations would like to thank William C. Stutt, USNA class of 1949, for his generous donation that supports the lecture series and the support of the Naval Academy Foundation as well. And we may have a few midshipmen who trickle in here a little bit late today. It's a big day on the yard. Today is uh, flight school date picking day for the naval future naval aviators. All of us aviators are in our flight suits to uh, support their issue of their first flight suit as they become nugget aviators. Um, so we think that maybe some of our audience members have been delayed. So if you see some midshipmen trickle in, please make room for them to take a seat next to you. So after today's lecture, we're going to have a brief Q&A period with midshipmen and faculty, and we'll wrap up by 1320 in order for our midshipmen to make it to class afterwards. So today we're joined by Dr. Roger Bailey. He is the class of 1957 postdoctoral fellow in American Naval Heritage in the Naval Academy History Department. He holds a PhD in US History from the University of Maryland College Park and a BA from the College of William and Mary. His doctoral dissertation, The Great Question, Slavery, Sectionalism, and the US Naval Officer Corps, 1820 to 1861, received the Society for Military History's Best First Manuscript Prize for 2022. And the work is currently under contract with Cornell University Press. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bailey. Thanks. Can we start with the next slide, Chris? All right, so a couple of you uh, may recognize uh, this man here on the right. I'm saying Mary Nod. <laughs> um, this is Governor Henry uh, Alexander Wise of Virginia, and he's most famous, if you've encountered him at all, uh, as the man who signed the abolitionist John Brown's death warrant after his raid uh, on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry just before the Civil War. I suspect fewer of you are familiar with the, uh, the man here on my left. Uh, his friend and cousin, Henry Augustus Wise, a lieutenant in the US Navy. Um, Lieutenant Wise had a, a fairly unremarkable career in the Navy. He had some military service in the Mexican-American War. Um, he was sort of stuck in the promotion system that I'll talk about in a minute in the Navy. Um, but he had a bit of a reputation outside the service uh, based on a, a series of experiences that he'd had um, with books that he had published uh, and, and novels uh, on a whole bunch of his experiences, uh, written under a string of uh, actually, can we go ahead and skip? He wrote a bunch of novels written under, and I, I'm not kidding, the pen name Harry Gringo, <laughs> um, which comes from his first book about his experience in the Mexican American War. Um, he wrote th this string of sensational novels that he described as being driven by a machinery of pirates, crocodiles, Creole girls, and anacondas. Um, but he also wrote a children's book, uh, which you see here, uh, the larger book. Uh, that was very succinctly named the story of the gray African parrot who was rescued by the little sailor boy in the river Gaboon, how he whistled and how he talked, including his great battle with the monkeys, which lasted six weeks, and how he behaved during the awful shipwreck together with some account of his later days. Um, if the title didn't tip you off, uh, it's, it's not a very good children's book. <laughs> um, but it did contain a really interesting line uh, in the story. Uh, a cabin boy and his pet parrot uh, are on a voyage that stopped in Liberia, and Wise describes this favorably as a free republic like our own. Wise was endorsing African colonization here, which was a movement to resettle free African Americans and newly freed slaves in West Africa. And his reference here to African Americans and slavery wasn't unique. 
his other books uh, discuss topics like the transatlantic slave trade uh, and pro-slavery invasions in Latin America. I'm not aware uh, of any other antebellum officers who wrote children's books specifically, um, but Wise's writing side hustle was also relatively common uh, among officers in this antebellum era, this period of the, the decades leading up to the Civil War. Uh, and as questions about the future of slavery uh, in the United States became a bigger deal, those issues found their way into other officers' writing as well. Many of them pitched their own solutions to this slavery dilemma, um, almost always based on the idea of expatriating African Americans. Uh, some of the schemes were based on freedom, some of them were based on continued bondage, but almost all of them were trying to unite whites on both pro and anti-slavery sides of the debate um, with proposals that they uh, claimed would remove obstacles to the gradual abolition of slavery, uh, benefit slaveholders, and create a whiter America. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so first, we need a little bit of background on this phenomenon of authors as, author, as officers as authors. Um, beyond their influence as commanders of ships in the 19th century, American naval officers also exercised a second uh, form of influence as public figures. And this grows in part uh, out of the Navy's promotion problems in this era. Um, it had a, a, sen a seniority-based system. Uh, that meant that the upper ranks of the Navy were clogged with elderly officers who just wouldn't retire. And to, to illustrate my point here, um, this strapping young man that you see here is Captain Charles Stuart in the War of 1812. He had already been a captain for six years when the War of 1812 started. Um, and when the Civil War started, half a century later, if you could go ahead, he was still in the Navy <laughs> as a captain, taking up one of these spots that could have been occupied uh, by a younger and healthier officer. <laughs> so uh, by the 1850s, people like our friend Henry, Ang uh, Henry Augustus Wise uh, could expect to serve as lieutenants into their 40s or even their 50s. So they didn't really have much chance for promotion. Um, since this was mostly peacetime, they didn't have a lot of opportunities for prize money. Uh, so officers started looking for other ways uh, to benefit from their service, to make more money, to, to make a name for themselves. Um, and so drawing from their professional experiences, dozens of them uh, traveled the lecture circuit. Uh, they wrote uh, exploring expedition reports, articles, textbooks, uh, histories, memoirs, novels, in Wise's case, a children's book. Um, some of these were official, many of them were not. Slide. Officers' speeches and, and writings in this era reached an ever larger audience uh, because of the penny press and because of changes uh, made to how illustrations were printed that made it possible to mass produce really vivid, uh, high quality and dramatic images uh, you know, affordably for the first time. So uh, most Americans in this period never really had a chance to travel much. Um, they sort of you know, tended to, to live more or less in the same place where they, they grew up. And so travel literature became popular for its ability uh, to allow Americans to see, see the world and to blend education with adventure and exoticism, as you can see from some of these images here. Uh, this, it's hard to see with the light, but this, this lower image is uh, a picture of uh, a ship passing an iceberg uh, from one of the Arctic exploring expeditions. Um, now, the naval travel accounts in particular in this era of travel literature uh, were especially popular and, and seemed credible to the readers. Uh, the Navy in this period uh, of peacetime was taking on more scientific roles, missions like exploration. Uh, it was founding scholarly institutions like the Naval Academy and like the Naval Observatory in Washington. Um, and officers' accounts, especially from exploring expeditions, were often published by Congress in collaboration with civilian scientists. Um, so they were particularly uh, you know, eagerly consumed, and as the public consumed their ideas um, and you know, their, their stories, they were consuming these officers' assumptions about race and their beliefs about slavery and the future of slavery. Slide. Naval accounts uh, compared slave societies to the American South. They presented ethnographic arguments. Uh, about different races' suitability for labor. Uh, they argued that slavery civilized black people, um, and they warned about the dangers that would befall societies that abolished slavery. You're seeing here an illustration um, on my right. Uh, 
of uh, an illustration from the U.S. Navy Exploring Expeditions report that's depicting African, uh, what were called country marks. And these are uh, distinctive cultural markings, uh, tattoos, piercings, uh, tooth filing, things, things like that that uh, could be used to identify what people, uh, in what, what like native people in African uh, originated from. And it was provided alongside commentary uh, about how these different ethnicities were suited in terms of their temperament for things like slave labor. Uh, on the other side, you're seeing an image uh, from an officer's memoir showing, uh, you know, a uh, in encounter with a Portuguese uh, colony in Angola. Portrayals like this took place uh, in w within the context of a national debate that included other works like Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, and some officers weighed right into this debate uh, and provided their own solutions, um, usually trying to solve the slavery question with ideas like colonization. Uh, in the U.S., colonization begins in the 1810s under the American Colonization Society, or the ACS, and the movement basically supported African-American migration to what would become Liberia and West Africa. And colonizationists were a, kind of a strange coalition. Uh, many of them believed that, like, honestly, the best way for African-Americans to obtain equal rights and freedom was to be removed from white racism in Africa, uh, that this would be a positive improvement. Um, others thought that this might help encourage slave owners uh, to free slaves because uh, they wouldn't have to live alongside th the free African-American population that that would create. Uh, slave owners were concerned about free African-Americans as a source of, uh, you know, facilitating slave resistance. And so they were generally very uncomfortable uh, with, those with a, a free, free black population in the South. Uh, but there were also a lot of slaveholders that supported colonization for pro-slavery reasons. Um, in part because it would remove this troublesome uh, population that was living in the midst of Southerners. Uh, so initially, this coalition coming together with both pro and anti-slavery interests facilitates bipartisan political support for colonization among white Americans. African Americans, on the other hand, were generally uncomfortable with the pro-slavery in influence in this group, and many of them didn't like the idea of being uprooted from you know, their homes and families in the United States and transplanted to a foreign land. So colonization was popular, but was struggling to find uh, people who would volunteer to immigrate. Uh, from the very beginning of this, US naval officers, who were of course all white, were uh, major supporters of colonization. They liked its conciliatory stance on slavery. Um, they liked the fact that it would expand American influence into Africa. And so when stationed on the coast of Africa, um, a lot of naval officers did whatever they could to support the Liberian settlements. And when they got home, they would take up their pens and they would start writing uh, in support uh, of the colonization movement. Officers from both North and South wrote to colonization societies, uh, praising the success in Liberia, counteracting uh, accusations that anti-colonizationists were making about the colonies being destined for failure, and they allowed these letters to be published. Some officers, like Lieutenant Robert Stockton of New Jersey, uh, took even more uh, active measures. Um, Stockton sort of gets his start with colonization, taking a leading role in the founding of the, the city of Monrovia, uh, which you can see depicted here. He, he literally, in the treaty negotiations, uh, actually uh, forced the uh, native African ruler to cede the land at gunpoint. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then when he came home, he stayed involved in the colonization movement. He was elected as the president of the New Jersey Colonization Society. Um, he uh, became its delegate to the National Convention, gave the opening remarks that were published in the first issue of the Society's Journal. Um, and Stockton, in all of this rhetoric, criticized what he called abolitionists' wild and destructive scheme uh, to end slavery abruptly and quickly. And he argued that colonization as a gradual solution was the best, was the best way to deal with this problem. His rhetoric uh, brought together both pro and anti-slavery colonizationists. Uh, especially white colonizationists, and it even seemed to make the idea a little bit more palatable to some African Americans. Um, after an address in New York, a black newspaper editor named Samuel Cornish reflected that if the designs of the American Colonization Society were such as represented by that pious and talented gentleman, I at once would be a colonizationist. Although ultimately, he still felt like he couldn't trust the movement despite Stockton's uh, support. Beginning around 1830, anti-colonizationists 
uh, like Frederick Douglass and other abolitionists, began pushing even harder for an immediate end uh, to slavery in the United States. And in response to this immediatist uh, abolitionism and the growing importance of cotton, um, a lot of Southerners also radicalized on the slavery question and started arguing that slavery was not you know, a necessary evil that should eventually go away, but was actually a, a positive good, that it was an uplifting force for African Americans. And so the colonization movement starts uh, getting flack on both sides from pro and anti-slavery forces. And this makes naval officers even more important as some of the key defenders of this movement. Um, one colonizationist congressman from Ohio, as an example, uh, started countering uh, anti-colonizationist criticisms about the climate being unlivable in Liberia uh, by citing naval officers' accounts and, and explaining that if you scan the characters of these witnesses, you would find them unimpeached and unimpeachable. Uh, naval officers' credibility as professional officers uh, was lending their credence to this movement. Officers' publications also became even more common right at this critical moment because of the foundation of the Africa Squadron and the fact that for the first time there were large numbers of American naval officers regularly on the coast of Africa having these firsthand experiences that they could write about. One example uh, was N uh, Navy purser Horatio Bridge of Maine uh, who wrote a memoir called Journal of an African Cruiser. And although he insisted that he was not a colonizationist, um, he emphasized the need for a separate society for African Americans to have true equality. And his work was particularly popular thanks to extensive editing by his friend, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. <laughs> the most influential of these works, though, uh, was Africa and the American Flag, which was a uh, bestseller by Lieutenant Andrew Hull Foote of Connecticut. His book cited religious, commercial, and nationalist reasons for spreading American influence in Africa through colonization. And it was so popular uh, that it enabled him to get face-to-face uh, -face meetings with a lot of lawmakers in Washington. Um, he started speaking at ACS annual meetings um, and was quoted regularly in congressional debates. As African uh, colonizationism came under criticism, a handful of officers also put forward alternative solutions um, that had the same types of functions of reducing the nation's black population, shoring up Southern slavery, and uh, potentially encouraging emancipation. Uh, most of these works, uh, if you could skip to the next slide, please. Um, oh, sorry, some, some of the vivid imagery from uh, Hull's, uh, Hull's book. Um, so these works were promoted mostly by a clique of uh, primarily Southern naval officers led by Matthew Fontaine Maury of Virginia, whose name some of you uh, might recognize from Maury Hall, or now Building 105. Um, Maury at the time was the superintendent of the Naval Observatory uh, from 1842 to 1860. He was also the most prominent scientist in the Navy and, and possibly even in the country because of his groundbreaking research on winds and currents. Maury, field, Maury feared that the growing black population in the United States would gradually overwhelm whites, leading to what he called a death struggle between the races. In articles and books, he argued that this potential race war was a problem for both pro uh, and anti-slavery uh, political partisans uh, to deal with. If slavery were abolished, he asked, how are so many people to be got rid of? If retained, how are they to be controlled? He explained that it was not to be supposed that the states in question will ever emancipate if the liberated slaves are to stay where they are. And the trickle of black immigration to Liberia convinced him that, that colonization in Africa was not going to be the solution. Instead, uh, Maury drew on his research on winds and currents, um, which he believed would create a trade link between the Deep South uh, and South America, and particularly Brazil and the Amazon River Valley. Uh, you can sort of see a little bit on this map here. Uh, there's arrows showing the flow of currents sort of along the coast of South America up into the Gulf of Mexico by the U.S. Gulf Coast, by the U.S. US Gulf Coast, and between Florida and Cuba. Uh, so Maury believed that this meant that economic growth in South America would enrich the South and the United States, um, and so he, he started working on a solution to this. He believed that the black population um, was uniquely suited to actually develop this rainforest tropical region. Um, and so he proposed the idea that America could send uh, either, uh, you know, either s s sell slaves to Brazil, uh, which was already a slave society, or American slaveholders could migrate to Brazil, bringing their enslaved workers with them, uh, develop this region. Um, and, you know, this would in turn uh, 
create more economic growth in South America and, and uh, support the South as well. And all the while creating a safety valve, in his words, for this surplus black population that he saw in the United States. Basically, uh, Morey's plan here is offering sort of a pro-slavery foil to colonization, right? One that is based not on freedom for the African Americans that are moving here, but on continued bondage. He used his post at the Naval Observatory uh, to basically promote this plan as well. Um, his close friend and brother-in-law was Lieutenant William Lewis Herndon. You could go to the next slide. Uh, this is Herndon of the Herndon of Herndon Monument fame, um, who. Uh, Maury was able to secure for Herndon a position leading an expedition to explore the Amazon rainforest. Uh, and the official mission here was to explore the commercial prospects of the region and conduct some scientific research. Uh, but Maury also sent Herndon secret instructions that were explaining that the true objective of his mission uh, was to see whether this area was really viable for slavery and for this migration scheme that Maury was envisioning. And when Herndon gets back, uh, Maury promotes his expedition report that he publishes, that you can see here. Um, uh, he promotes it you know, with articles and, and uh, public appearances. Um, the expedition report itself cites Maury and, and basically parrots his scheme, and it also provided information on uh, the price of slaves uh, in Brazil, the suitability of the soil for cotton, um, and the benefits that might be achieved by American migration to this region. Uh, this ultimately is going to become a scheme that's very popular at Southern commercial conventions, which are sort of, uh, you know, conventions for business-minded Southerners to meet and discuss, you know, possible economic opportunities. Uh, and a lot of them start calling for the federal government to subsidize steamship lines uh, to the Amazon. And Maury also uh, asks for the federal government to negotiate the opening of the Amazon River to American uh, commerce as well and, and navigation. Uh, William Lynch, seen here, uh, was another naval explorer and also a very close friend of Maury. Uh, and he advanced similar ideas to this uh, with sort of a different spin. He commanded an 1847 uh, exploring expedition to the Dead Sea and the River Jordan in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, as with Herndon, uh, Matthew Maury promotes this expedition and its, its report when he comes back, uh, which ultimately becomes very popular. It becomes a bestseller. It actually is parodied by comedians. Um, and, and it shares Lynch's ideas with the country as well. And Lynch himself was an African colonizationist. He actually would go on to lead an exploring expedition in Liberia. Um, and he was also unusually critical of slavery for a Virginian at this time. And his expedition report reflected some of these ideas. And in particular, uh, he was uh, very, uh, he, his, his account lamented the condition of free African Americans uh, in the United States, which uh, in his words, um, on our soil, uh, freedom carried no healing on its wings uh, for African Americans. But Lynch ultimately considered racism in the United States insurmountable. Uh, the only hope, in his words, for African Americans was removal beyond the barriers of prejudice. So his expedition to the Ottoman Empire provides him with an idea that would solve this solution. Uh, because the Ottoman Empire had just recently started cotton production. And uh, Lynch predicts that there is going to be high demand for uh, you know, people who have experience growing cotton uh, to migrate to the Ottoman Empire. So for free African Americans, he thinks that this is a potential way that they can escape racism in the United States and potentially find lucrative employment. Uh, and he also believes that planters have an economic opportunity he uh, here too, to get in on the ground floor and again, bring their enslaved workers with them to the Ottoman Empire. But Lynch argues that this is not actually um, a, an expansion of American slavery because Ottoman law, uh, in, in his understanding of it, dictated that slaves could only be hold for seven years. So by bringing enslaved workers to the Ottoman Empire, uh, essentially he, they would be enacting a gradual emancipation plan where you know, the slave owner would have this, these laborers for seven years and then they would be guaranteed to get their freedom. Essentially, Lynch here offers a hybrid plan uh, you know, between colonization, which is based you know, on freedom for African Americans, uh, and Maury's plan, which is based on continued slavery, uh, and, and Lynch here is promoting one that's sort of a mix of the two, temporary uh, continuance of slavery. Now, none of these schemes that these officers put forward uh, ever fully materialized. Colonization in Africa uh, didn't curb slavery in the United States. Um, it didn't significantly reduce the nation's black population. At any given time in the antebellum era, there were several million enslaved African Americans in the US. 
uh, and total for 50 years of migration to Africa, there were something like 15,000 African Americans um, who actually uh, decided to make this journey. So barely any effect on US society. Similarly, Maury Herndon and Lynch um, did reach a wide audience, uh, but they weren't really able to bring about any concrete policy changes with their plans. Uh, the US had such obvious territorial ambitions and greed that Latin American countries were really uncomfortable with Maury's proposals uh, and reluctant to open the Amazon to, to uh, American navigation or to American migration. And uh, Lynch's plan isn't really successful because cotton doesn't take off quite as quickly as he expects uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, even uh, you know, slaveholders who were willing to free their slaves with this plan were you know, reluctant to migrate to a, a Muslim country and this very risky business venture that they would essentially be gambling their fortunes on. So not too much actually materializes from these. But I, I think there are still a few lessons that we can learn from this. For one, it's useful to point out that uh, these officers proposed solutions to the slavery question were all relatively similar uh, despite their different attitudes uh, about slavery itself. Um, you know, we have a spectrum here with colonization on one end and Matthew Morey on the other with, with plans like Lynch's in the middle. But all of them fundamentally are trying to shore up slavery in the United States to win support from slaveholders, um, but implying a distant future where slavery could potentially go away and the country could be freer and whiter in their views. Um, and that, this tells us that even as politics were becoming more divisive in the United States, naval officers tended to share similar kinds of values and views about slavery and empire and the relationship between the two of those that helped them unite around these sorts of compromise policies on the slavery question. We can also see the Navy's mixed legacy in the way uh, that these common values tried to preserve the Union and with it slavery. Their publications carried weight among middle-class middle uh, white Americans uh, because of their credibility and their exciting content. Um, and this, this, plays, this has a significant influence. As historian uh, Nicholas Gayat has described, um, the idea of colonization, um, he describes colonization as essentially a, a life raft for liberal whites who didn't want to give up on the idea of uh, you know, equality for all man and the Declaration of Independence, but weren't actually willing to live alongside black citizens. Uh, and so with their accounts uh, and their attempts to sort of build these compromise solutions that were overseas uh, and externally facing, essentially uh, they're able to keep that life raft afloat and that hope of compromise afloat in these heavy seas of the 1850s. It, which is also sort of showing the extent that officers have influence beyond the quarter deck, uh, you know, in broader uh, domestic discourse. We also see some of the potential misuses of that influence that officers had in this period. These publications often presented officers' uh, views as, uh, on race as scientific, even though they had no real expertise that they were drawing on in most cases. Um, and they kept this host hope of compromise alive uh, at the expense of the wishes of African Americans uh, and with schemes that were you know, going to be supporting slavery, at least in the short term. Um, and ultimately, they still weren't able to preserve the Union. And you know, when they were forced to make a decision, many of them, in fact, joined the Confederacy. Next slide. And finally, I think it's important to remember that officers don't actually stop having this kind of influence over public debate in the 1800s or with the Civil War. Americans today are still just as eager to consume the ideas of servicemen and women. And like with these early naval officers, that's based uh, partly on the weight that their, that their accounts and their ideas carry because of their uh, experience, this unique experience that they have in the military and the credibility that that gives them, which uh, you know, can still shape public opinion in both good and bad ways. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for a fascinating discussion. I, I, I'm always uh, tempted to go into the compare and contrast mode, which I'm going to try to push you into, which I know you're not really wanting to do, but that's okay. Um, the whole question of the Royal Navy and anti-slavery and the whole stuff going on with Sierra Leone. Is there any connectivity or any general thoughts you could offer on that? I mean, I know that that was a big issue for the UK, certainly. I don't, and also, you know, just, just a little, little tiny compare. Yeah, so uh, the naval officers and the Royal Navy have uh, sort of a weird tension in this period because most naval officers see Britain and the Royal Navy as the country's main threat, especially at sea. 
Uh, and so there's a, a tendency for hostility. They see Britain as like interfering with American commerce and stuff like that, especially in Britain's slave trade program, uh, slave trade suppression program. Um, but on the flip side, most officers did like want to oppose the slave trade, for example. Um, they had this, a lot of them supported colonization in the way that a lot of British officers tended to be interested in, in similar ideas as well with Sierra Leone. Um, and so they, they actually, the Africa station is one of the places where there, there are a lot of these weird instances of officers cooperating. Uh, there, there's sort of a dichotomy where it's one of the places where there's most friction because that's where, you know, the slave trade suppression is, is most vigorous, but also like they, they, they cooperate and they have to cooperate because uh, slave traders in particular are using the American flag to conceal the slave trading. So they need, the British need the Americans and the Americans don't have enough resources themselves. In particular, they, they don't have like steamships or fast enough ships to catch slave traders. So if they can work with the British, they can meet each other's needs. So yeah, it's a, it's a, I don't know if that sort of answers your question. It's a complicated relationship. Yeah. Uh, good, yeah. Good yeah. <laughs> yeah, Shrika. Yeah, you reference more than one officer who was pro colonization and particularly trying to expand US influence in Africa. Could you talk a little bit about how they would have envisioned the relationship between the US and you know Liberia or pre Liberia or Sierra Leone at that time? Yeah, so um, with with Liberia specifically, um, the United States formally does not treat it uh, as a colony, so it's in this very awkward sort of liminal place. Uh, the, the, the Liberians, because it's, it's not a colony, and, and later when Liberia declares independence, it's not even recognized as an independent country. So the, the Liberians, many of them are actually still like American citizens or can claim American citizenship. And so there's this sort of awkward state where, where the officers um, are, are able to protect these interests and, and go out of their way, in fact, to protect their interests um, as, as a way of sort of asserting U.S. influence in the region, uh, even though in theory they shouldn't because the government doesn't recognize Liberia. They like Liberia um, because it's, it's, for one, it's a place that can sort of serve as a base of operation for Christian missionary work into Africa, so they see it as Christianizing. Um, Liberians are trying to sign treaties with local, uh, you know, different African nations to stop the slave trade, so they see it as sort of the land component of this two-pronged anti-slave trade uh, policy to, to try to stamp out the slave trade in the region, so they support it for that reason. And there's also a lot of interesting accounts of naval officers apparently becoming aware of African Americans as like American people for the first time in Liberia when they're juxtaposed with native Africans who they see, you know, as, as savages. And so um, they, you know, officers in Liberia like do things, uh, some of them in their memoirs write really interesting stories about how it's like my, you know, my friends back home would be like laughing hysterically to see me like dining as a guest at this colored gentleman's house. But they, they would, they would be, behave if you were like, you know, an upper class black gentleman in Liberia, they would treat you like you were an upper, upper class American gentleman because by, you know, comparison, that was, that was the closest you were going to get to American society. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of, a less subversive and threatening idea, I think, because it's like over there, and so it's not directly in contact with U.S. society, and they can kind of indulge in this sort of, uh, it's sort of a fantasy or almost play acting, I think. But but they can sort of indulge in, in humoring this idea of black people as as you know full people, um, because they're in Africa and they're so far away. If that, if that sort of yeah yeah uh, yeah so. Uh, I'm really interested in what you identify as the continuity in the views of these officers, even though they actually see them different, right? And so it was kind of like a, a moderate view. Because obviously the progressive liberal I think the thing they do is to say that slavery is bad, but let's not go crazy, right? Yeah. It's like free whites and free blacks can live together. And I'm curious about the origins of that view. Is that is that a fairly um, widespread stance? Is it based in certain segments or regions of the country? And, and kind of is that something that they get from their, their background, I guess I'm asking, or is it something that they sort of get cultured into? Yeah, based on a, a great question. Yeah, so it's, it's very Jeffersonian in a lot of ways. They tend to see slavery in this sense of being like, I mean, I say Jeffersonian as though Jefferson has like clear <laughs> views on slavery that aren't muddy or complicated at all. Um, but, but Jefferson often talks about slavery as this sort of necessary evil that eventually should go away someday down the road. And so like a lot of them uh, kind of draw on that similar idea. And, and as the society is, is moving towards either no, slavery is wrong, it needs to go away now, or like no, slavery is good, the officer corps tends to sort of stay in that, that 
view, which was most common uh, in my experience in sort of the like kind of mid-Atlantic, like upper south and lower northern states in particular, um, although you see it you see it across the country. Um, and, uh, and this kind of makes sense with the demographics of the officer corps because they are disproportionately mid-Atlantic and especially from Virginia, Maryland, and DC. Um, so these are areas where slavery is, is still profitable, but it, it, it's not quite profitable in, in the way that it, it's like exploded with cotton production in the South. And so uh, they're maybe not quite, haven't gone quite as hard in this like diehard Calhoun, slavery is a positive good direction. Um, and because the officer corps is blending officers from across the country together, uh, this sort of more moderate view, you know, sort of becomes the most popular, easy, easily agreed upon approach to take with slavery, I think. Yeah, right. So you mentioned that some officers uh, favored library because they saw it as a hold for American missionaries. And I know in the British Navy, even from right after 1807, there was some significant minority of naval officers who were evangelicals and who were personally committed to abolition for religious reasons, even though they were the majority. And then after 1815, that, that really grew. So there was a substantial number whose religious feelings aligned them with policy. And that seems probably not true in the American Navy, but could you say a little about how religious beliefs informed the American officers? So that's something I'm, I'm trying to identify more of. I've actually, I mean, there are, are, are numerous fairly religious officers. I think I think Foote actually is, is fairly religious himself. But ev even the religious officers that I've encountered don't tend to take uh, a very strong stance on slavery in light of that, which is odd to me. Um, I, I think there should be more. I've, I've encountered maybe one or two officers who are like, you know, sort of in this, in the mode of this second great awakening change of, in religion, like seem like actually abolitionists. But, but I've actually encountered very few of them. Um, it hasn't been something I've been uh, looking for very closely, though, so it's something I need to do a little bit more research on. But yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. I know around the Civil War era, Frederick Douglass is making speeches defending the American Constitution as a anti-slavery document, that essentially the document itself isn't flawed. The way we've used it is flawed, but the, the US Constitution is a net moral good. Now, with naval officers taking an oath, albeit not the one we have today, but still just an oath to support and defend the Constitution, do you see any ideological alignment between their duty to this Constitution, which was meant to be a bastion for protecting individual rights, and that fueling either of their, of their divergent views on slavery's place in American society? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think. To the extent that I've seen it, officers see themselves in this period first and foremost as like Americans, like in terms of identity, more so than your average American who often still see them, himself as or herself as, uh, you know, a, a Virginian or a, a Northerner or what have you. Um, Officers are, uh, uh, some of my students are here, and we just talked about this in class today. Uh, they, they, you know, grow up as, you know, starting as like teenagers usually, uh, they grow up together in these tight-knit communities um, with people from across the country, um, and they, they travel around, They're, they spend a lot of their time sort of defining themselves overseas in relation to these other nationalities. Um, and that, um, per perhaps more than the, the oath itself, but, but it, it pairs with the oath, they strengthen their sense that like, you know, we're a country, we need to band together to, you know, protect American interests and American liberty. Uh, and so they see abolitionists as a threat to that constitution in particular. They're, they, a lot of them don't like pro-slavery, like, like Southern fire eaters and, and hardline pro-slavery advocates either. And they, they do tend to see them as destabilizing. But abolitionists in particular, they see as, as sort of, tend to see as like the root of, of all of this domestic instability. Um, and so they are uh, usually very anti-abolitionist. And I think this is why I haven't actually seen many abolitionists is because I think the dominant culture in the officer corps is like anti-abolitionist and you probably would keep it to yourself if you were, you know, uh, a radical, like a dangerous radical like that. that makes sense. Uh, Mary, did you have a? I, I study um, Confederate general officers who decide they can't live without their slaves and they immigrate to Mexico or Brazil. Um, and stay there. Do we have, have you found any evidence of naval officers who were slave 
At the end of the war? Yeah. Uh, so I don't, uh, there are, there are um, there's a book called um, Admiral of the Amazon on one, um, I think it's John Randolph Tucker or something like that, um, which I, I, don't, I, I don't think he's particularly famous himself. Uh, I could get you the specific name later. I, I, if it is John Randolph Tucker, I don't think he's particularly famous himself, but the names might sound familiar because you know, he's from these like, leading, leading sort of aristocratic Southern families. Uh, there, there are a few that do. Uh, Maury himself goes to Mexico after the war, um, but uh, not uh, with, I don't believe, with, with actual like, his, his enslaved <laughs> workers or anything like that. Um, sorry? Because slavery is illegal. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, Maury? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, you did? So you mentioned the, the one African-American newspaper editor, mm -hmm. right, who went to one of Stockton's mm -hmm. talks. But have you come across other, other free black African-American voices that kind of connect with this? Or is that just kind of lost because the source base is so limited? Yeah, so it is a limited source base. Uh, there are a couple. Uh, there, it's easier to find ones that connect actually with these uh, exploring reports as, you know, as these travel accounts that often, you know, the, the, these sort of colonization schemes are, are kind of a sideshow in the, in the accounts, especially Lynch's, uh, like people have written whole books on Lynch's exploring expedition and they don't mention this at all because it's just like a few pages that he, he like goes on this tangent and is like, hey, this could work. Um, so sometimes even if they do comment on these works, they actually don't really talk about these. Um, if they do, they tend to fixate more on the way um, that officers describe societies. So in, in Lynch's case in particular, I can think of uh, an account that reflects on the fact that, that Lynch, uh, he act, he, I mean, he portrays the Ottoman Empire as being more humane as a slave society than America, right? Like partly because of this gradual abolition, but he talks about other things like, um, you know, more protection for uh, women who were enslaved um, and, um, uh, there are a couple other sort of, he, he talks about the fact that, um, you know, you could actually be fairly high status uh, as an enslaved person in the Ottoman Empire. Um, you know, if you were owned by someone who is himself high status, there's the, the Janissaries uh, are, are famous as an example of this. Uh, and, and all of these views that he has are, are kind of, I, th I think a modern scholar would probably find a lot to question. But he, he believes that, that this is good. And, and African Americans see this and they're like, hey, this is an example of how bad it is here that the Ottoman Empire is more progressive than us. Um, and so, yeah, they, they do engage with it and they, they try to, they take what they find valuable for, you know, their cause and tend to leave the rest or, or sometimes, you know, maybe criticize it less with Stockton. Um. All right. Well, thank you very much. Join me in thanking Roger. Thank you.